My name is Michael Trayan Todran, and I am today's host of the Landscape Architecture Podcast. And today I am with Bryce Carnell, and he is with Hunter Industries. Can you tell me a little bit about um, yourself and your role here at Hunter? Yeah, well, thank you, Michael, for having me. I'm Bryce Carnell. I'm the Corporate Social Responsibility Manager here at Hunter Industries. My role really is, when you boil it all down, is to find a balance between the people that we have influences over, whether it's our employees or our customers or employee families, maybe it's people in the government. Um, then there's the planet side of things. So it's, it's the people that we influence, the planet that we impact. So we look at our impacts and we're trying to mitigate those impacts and minimize our, our negative impacts on the planet. And then there's profit. So it's people, planet, and profit. So my, my job is to find a balance between all three of those. And when did you um, start here at Hunter? So I started in Hunter in, uh, in 2012. And uh, I came to Hunter as a sales manager, really, um, working with landscape architects uh, to, to specify irrigation projects and find irrigation solutions. And you got your degree in landscape architecture from Cal Poly in 2005. Correct, yeah, my, my background's in landscape architecture. I, uh, I'm a plant nerd and I, uh, uh, I love designing with plants, love being out in the environment. Um, but, but really I found that, that my, my strengths didn't lie in the design side. I've considered myself more of a landscape engineer than anything else. Um, so um, yeah, so, so opportunity came to, came to help Hunter. Uh, to work with irrigation and irrigation specification, and uh, it was a great opportunity. So you and I just finished a tour, a chronological tour of Hunter Industries. Can you give me a recap of what we saw today from from the beginning to the end and in, in, in the parts? Yeah, it's. Um, yeah, I don't do that on a, on a regular basis, so it's fun just to recap for myself too. Um, but basically, here at Hunter, we're a, we're a vertically integrated manufacturer, manufacturer. So we house every part of the process from design, real engineering, concept design, R and D, looking at at whether a product's gonna gonna actually make sense, three um, D printing and things like that. And then you have to build a tool for pl plastic injection molding. So all the steel tools that go into to making the forms and the molds for every single little component and part that goes into irrigation part and component to complete a full, full working piece. Then there's assembly. So we have different, either it's a machine or it's a, an individual or group of people working together to put irrigation components together to build a, a working piece like you see behind me here. And then we go through the whole process of, of our distribution center. We've got our distribution center on campus where our products ship to over 126 countries worldwide. They all go flow through our one dis distribution center here in San Marcos. We have our own marketing department and creative department as well. So everything from that you can imagine the process from the design to the marketing and, uh, and distribution, everywhere in between there is, is housed right here in San Marcos. And how large is this facility here? So in San Marcos, we have nine buildings on campus, and you know, five of which are, are LEED certified. We also have a facility in Tijuana, uh, in, in, uh, in Claremont, Florida as well, and then a few little distribution kind of warehouse area centers um, throughout the nation, throughout the globe as well. So tell me about the process from receiving the resin and then going into the into the actual mold. Right, so, so the majority of our products are made from, from plastic resin pellets. Um, so we receive that from one of our suppliers and it's shipped here to on, on campus. We have, a, we have three silos that these tiny little plastic pellets are, are, are filled into these silos. It goes into a drying room where it's dried, the immunity is all taken out of that so they make sure that we can make a, 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 a product to spec. For some of our colorant products, things that are blue and red and green and things like that, we use white acetal, and that's mixed with different colorant pieces. So you might see a ratio of 1% colorant to 99% white acetal, and you get a solid blue color out of that, per se. Uh, the other large component is just our, is our ABS black plastic, too. So, so that's shipped on a truck, filled into our silos. It's dried automatically through our drying system, and then fed through a, a series of tubes into the, the manufacturing component machines. 
it's it's really interesting too to see the network of of tubes and cables and and processes where it goes from our drying room upstairs down to our molding room downstairs. And you have your own tooling department here, right? Yeah. So so our own tooling department allows us to to on site make molds, make tooling molds from the designs our engineers are coming up with. So if you can imagine, an engineer builds, is building a, um, a, a rotor. So you need the body and the cap and all those kind of things. But when we're thinking about plastic injection molding, we need to build the opposite of that object, the invert of that object. So that's what our tooling department does, is they look at the specs built from the engineering department, and they say, okay, we're gonna build the inverse cavity of this so it could be filled with this plastic injection molding. So that department builds those on a regular basis and also maintains them as well. I mean, just like any other mechanical piece, you, there's maintenance that's included in that. And we do that all here on campus. And then tell me about the founder. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, Ed Hunter uh, was, is our founder, uh, was our founder. Um, he started way back when, um, really during an urban stroll, I noticed this need for irrigation components in, in suburban areas. And he developed a product on his own called Moistomatic. And Moistomatic was a popular irrigation component, um, very successful, so successful that the Toro company caught wind and said, hey, that's really interesting. We want you to come work for us and develop some products for us. And they had a great, prosperous relationship. But as Ed started to develop the new concept and new ideas, um, Toro wasn't so aligned with where Ed was going with his ideas. Brass versus plastic. Yeah, a lot of brass versus plastic. And, uh, and Ed you know, kind of funnily said, hey, uh, you know, the future is in plastic. And there were some discrepancies there of what, what the future actually held. So um, Ed, being the um, ingenious individual he was, he, he kept all of his own patents that he developed under, under Toro and said, okay, I'm going to take, I'm going to, Thank you so much for the time working in R&D Toro. I'm going to start my own business. They agreed to a one-year non-compete compete clause. And in 1981, Hunter Industries opened right here in San Marcos, California. And, and the first product to hit the shelves from Hunter was the Series 75, which is basically the PGP as we know it today. That's really cool. Yeah. And it's still, this is still a private company. Yeah, we are still a private company, family-owned and held private, you know, family-owned family owned and run company. So um, we started with Ed Hunter. Ed Hunter and Paul Hunter, his son, really founded the company together. Um, Richard Hunter came on second. Paul's brother, Ed's, Ed's other son, uh, came on. And, and Paul and, and Richard really started to grow the business, and they were more the business minds, and Ed was the mechanical genius behind it. Ann Hunter uh, came on board, too. Ann Hunter Wellborn uh, came on board and, and really helped out with with a lot of our HR department and again, growing the business. And her, her real big influence on the company was the idea that you know, making money and being profitable is not mutually exclusive from, from you know, being conscious of what's going on with the environment and our impacts on the environment and our impacts on people. So, so I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit later, but it's this idea of sustainability and corporate responsibility that, that Anne brought to, uh, to Hunter. And then the, the Hunter who's running the company now is Greg Hunter. Greg is the, the grandson of Ben Hunter, and, uh, and Greg is leading the company into a, uh, uh, a legacy of, of diversity as we're, we're acquiring new businesses and different businesses, all, all kind of wrapped around the, uh, the plastic injection molding manufacturing process. Okay, what are some of the best design practices? All right, so some of the best design practices. Um, I'm a little biased here because, like you said, I was a, a practicing landscape architect for a while before I came to Hunter. So, you know, obviously, when we think about irrigation design, the, the job of a landscape architect or an irrigation designer at this point is to make sure that we're keeping the landscape that's been designed alive and healthy while conserving the resource that goes into it. So water and, in some cases, electricity, because electricity and water are just intrinsically tied together. So when you think about concepts, it's, it's making sure that the water is applied to the landscape efficiently. 
in overhead applications, it's it's head-to-head -head coverage. It's making sure the manufacturer specifications are accounted for. Um, when you're looking at at um, you know, making sure that spray heads aren't going to go right into a shrub and wash down the, the road and things like that too. Using drip and point source irrigation application devices where it's where it's appropriate and needed. It goes beyond that though too. That's a lot of the application stuff, but. Um, you know, there's there's the different tools that go into the application. So you know every head, every application device is is designed to operate at a specific pressure. So pressure regulation comes into into play, and it's been really big the last couple of years as far as a a really great water conservation tool, water management tool, is making sure that either the head or the valve is pressurized to where you need it to be to make that application device work appropriately. Things like check valves, so we're not losing water after the system closes. You know, it's these, these ideas of how do we manage that water and put it down the landscapes where it's needed and when it's needed. And when you talk about managing there too, you talk about the whole idea of, of smart controllers and ET control and things like that and making sure that we're following the bell curve of water needs throughout the seasons, not having it either a, a flat or, a, or even, a, even a stair step big stair step kind of fat, but a, a rolling undulating water curve bell just to match what the landscape's needing. Um, and then uh, tell me more about the development of your sensors and how they work. So you have, uh, you have solar, you have wind, right, for the sensors, and then um, you also are now being integrated within, with NOAA or with a... Right, yeah, so there's a, there's a couple different sensors that we have. Um, more on, there's some of the basic sensors, okay. like, a, like a rain sensor, like a rain click. So when it's raining outside, if it reaches a certain precipitation level, the system's gonna shut off. We call it, the, you know, we call it a click sensor because a, a, a solenoid or a sensor is tripped and we just shut things off. So a, a, things like a rain click, a wind click, if it's too windy outside, we're not gonna irrigate. A soil click, if the, if the soil's wet enough, we're not gonna irrigate. But then you get into the advancement, the advanced um, sensors, things like the solar sink. So the solar sink is a combination of, of a couple different sensors and it's, what it's doing is it's turning your irrigation controller into a smart controller. It's, it's reading the on-site weather data and it's, it's modifying the irrigation schedule to accommodate for that ET curve. And then you, you, beyond, like you mentioned, there's, there's the whole internet of connection things, the connection connectivity of things, and, um, and our product is, is HydroWise. HydroWise is a, is a software platform that's used with some of our controllers to, um, to use weather underground data to remotely modify your, your schedule for you. In design, there is subjectivity and objectivity. Right. Tell me about that. Yeah, so we were talking about this a little bit offline earlier. Um, you know, when I was practicing the, um, I find it so interesting that, that landscape architects and irrigation designers, people in the landscape industry, struggle or really bal go back and forth between the subjectivity and the objectivity of landscape, right? The subjectivity side is all this, this the aesthetic side. You know, how do we, hey, let's, let's create a space that's beautiful, that's aesthetically pleasing. Um, and that's, that's very subjective compared to who you're talking to, right? But then there's the whole engineering side. Like we're gonna take this piece of art that, that someone created, a designer created, and now we gotta make it work, right? So, so there's, there's all the structural stuff that goes behind that, whether it's concrete or soils or retaining walls. And then the irrigation component too, and hydrodynamics and or hydrodynamics and hydrology and pressure and all those different kind of things. So it's landscape architecture is really interesting in that in, in that manner because you're you're constantly going back between the right and the left side, side of your brain, and you're you're having to to translate that. Do you guys review people's irrigation plans if they ask? Yeah, do we review irrigation plans? Um, on a on a uh, as project basis, you know, our sales team will, will will help guide and make suggestions and and you know look for for things that stand out that don't look so well. Um, we are not an irrigation designer. We're not licensed. We're not a landscape architect as an entity. Um, so we don't really we don't take on that liability. But 
we are with the knowledge that we have and the I don't want to quite say experts, but you know, I think we're pretty good at, at knowing the product and knowing how it's supposed to be specified. So we are very good at looking at legends and making sure that things are specified and, and designed appropriately. Yeah. And you give cor like courses and courses in basic irrigation design? Yes, yeah, we do. We just launched um, new, basically, or, or new irrigation design courses. It's, it's Irrigation 101, Design 101. And, uh, and it's given through our Hunter University training program. I um, encourage those who are interested to go online and, and, and look at our training site. Um, it's a single sign-on. You can look at training for any one of our products, how-tos, uh, maintenance, and things like that. And, and then we just, like I said, launched our, our Irrigation Design 101 class as well. Where are you in regards to the state of green infrastructure? Green infrastructure, I really love talking about street green infrastructure these days because it's 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 putting landscape and irrigation on on a higher stage than we've ever seen it before when you talk about um, sustainability and 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 trying to become a green city green infrastructure really plays a big role in that and how do we clean our air how do we clean our water how do we how do we create a better environment for people to live Green infrastructure is really the answer. When I think about green infrastructure too, I think about just the, the ecosystem services that are provided by that. So whether it's oxygen production, shade production, there's obviously aesthetic value that we've, we've talked about, food production, habitat for, for wildlife. I mean, it's proven that, that people who have green views in their hospitals have shorter bed stays, so it's profitable. There's money to be made there, right? So, so when we think about green infrastructure, we think about how important that is and how equitable that is for, how, or how that needs to be provided equitably for, for communities, but really the need to support that as well. And that's where irrigation plays a really big part in that. And how do we, how do we use our res natural resource of water to make sure that we're supporting the green infrastructure efficiently? And a lot of them have different needs. So let's say, let's see if I could understand this correctly. You have agriculture. You have um, play, such as like golf. Then you have residential, and residential in different scales. And then you have um, commercial, and then probably, I guess, resort. Would that be its own, or that would probably be under commercial? Yeah, we call it residential commercial. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, when I was touring the, you know, all these uh, facilities that you have, you showed me one of the the golf rotors versus yeah. the, the residential, and it's significantly different. And yeah. what were the throws on that, the distance that they go? Yeah, so, so when you look at application device, overhead application devices, we go anywhere from you know foot and a half to two feet out to 180 plus feet, depending on what it was. And some of those, gro those golf rotors we were looking at, it was in that kind of 40, 60, out to 120 foot range, mm. yeah. And then what's the precipitation loss on those? Precipitation loss. Or what's, is that, did I say that incorrectly? Yeah, so there's precipitation rate. Yeah. yeah. So, so, pre, so the precip rates all depend on design too, right? So there's a, there's a precipitation rate from head to head coverage and it, that'll range for those big rotors like that will range anywhere from you know, 0.75 inches per hour, 0.5 inches per hour up to an inch and a half maybe. But the, you, typically the further throw that you have, the, the lower the precipitation rate you have because you're covering such a big area and there's so much water going out there. But the idea, I'm glad you, you mentioned precipitation rate because two things really. Precipitation rate is important because we wanna make sure that over an entire zone that's, that's irrigated, the precipitation rate is even. If we have differences in that same zone of precipitation rate, you're gonna have wet areas compared to dry areas and it really creates for an inefficient system. Also, too, when you think about precipitation rate of an irrigation system, you want to try to match that to the infiltration rate or the intake rate of your, of your soils that you're working with. So if you're working with clay soils, that's going to have a, a, a much lower intake rate. So we're not going to want to put a spray head on top of clay soils typically because you've got such a, a high precip rate of two inches per hour compared to the you know, whatever it might be, 0.2 inches per hour for the clay soil. So it's important to think about that when you're talking about design again, to think about matching or trying to align your precipitation rates of your irrigation products with your intake rates of your soils. If somebody is hearing the word or the acronym 
at MWILO for the first time, um, how do you explain to them what MWILO is? Yeah, the Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance of California. Yes. Um, yeah, MWILO is one of these documents that's, um, that really has transformed uh, through different, a series of different assembly bills uh, for, gosh, I think two, almost three decades now. Um, most currently, we had a revision of MWILO in 2015 when we had our executive drought order. Um, and, and basically what MWILO is, is it's a set of guidelines that direct irrigation designers, landscape architects of, of what parameters they are allowed to design an ir a, 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 a landscape to. And really it has to do with, with water consumption. So there's, there's a, a few basic scenarios there. There's the, the residential scenario. Let's just say that, that we had a residence that was completely covered with turf, and we were going to use 1,000 gallons of, of water to irrigate that an entire year. Um, under MWILO, only 55% of that water, of that, of that water used for the turf area, would be allowed to use for your landscape. And that's a rating of one. That, no, that's, that's the point. That's a 0.55 or 55%. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. And then there's... there's so the, a swimming pool would be one. So a swim, so this is where we get we're going to get really tricky here now. So okay. the swimming pools are interesting because um, typically they have a uh, an infill, right? But um, but are they considered a special landscape area, right? So a special landscape area has this value of one, one hundred percent. We get a hundred percent water allocation if that was just considered a turf area. So is it a special landscape area? Um, is it a recreation? source, like special, uh, special landscape areas are defined as, some municipalities say yes, some say no. If it's a private pool in someone's backyard, maybe not, maybe yes. And that's an argument that happens on a day-to-day -day basis at a local municipality. So what yeah. triggers MWILO? When yeah. do you have to uh, show the, the city that you're following these guidelines? So what triggers uh, an MWILO review? In the middle, it's it's three basic things. It's it's any new construction project with a landscape area of 500 square feet or greater. It's any landscape rehab project, or any rehab project with a landscape area of 2,500 square feet or greater, or any other project that has to go through some kind of municipal review and permit process. What is Wukols? Wukols, the water use classification of landscape species. And how do they? Tied yeah, so so M. Wheelow uses um, lightly references Wilkels for the water use classification of different species throughout the state of California. So we have very low, low, medium, high. Do we have a very high? No, high, high water I think use. high is the last one. Yeah, right? so there's there's different kind of water use. Um, Per plant, yeah. So the idea is when we're, we're looking at our planting plan and we're adding up the water use of these different species, we run these calculations provided by the MWILO document to say, okay, this amount of square footage is estimated to use about this much water. So we have these two calculations. It's, it's the estimated total water use and the maximum applied water allowance. So based upon the square footage of your area, in your different scenarios, whether you're a, a residential area, a commercial area, a school, you have different water allotments. And then you gotta make sure that your designed landscape falls at or underneath your water, allo your, uh, water allotment. So your, your maximum flood water allowance always has to be greater than your estimated total water use from your designed landscape. And who came up with, like, was there a board that came up with, the, like, the, like, botanists and arborists that came up with like what the water use was for for these plants because yeah. I've heard it was been criticized that it's not entirely accurate well, this is the thing about water use in different plants like I would do you look at an agapanthus or raphaelepis planted anywhere in, in a commercial setting you know arguably the water use of that plant is extremely low right I mean you could not barely not irrigate and establish one of those for months and it would do just fine. It would hang in there. But um, in a natural setting somewhere else or, or anywhere else, it would take all the water that you would give it almost too at the same time, right? So, so how do you define that? 
And that's really the arguability of or the argument behind Wilco's or behind any water use classification document, really, because MWILO doesn't really point to one as being the guiding document, is, is how do you define the subjectivity of the water use of a plant? And the exposure has a lot to do with it, too. Whether a plant's on the north side of the building or the south side of the building, it's part of the, the calculation there, too, of, of figuring that out. But, but still, it's... Yeah, there's a lot of arguments that, that go around that, and I'm not sure there's any one, one good solid definition of, of how to address that. What does head-to-head -head coverage mean? Yeah, so head-to-head -head coverage is when we're designing overhead irrigation zones, we want to make sure that the spray from one nozzle is hitting the opposite nozzle and vice versa. So basically what happens is when water comes out of a nozzle, there is much greater precipitation that happens right at the base of that nozzle. And then it gradually declines as you, as you get farther away from the head. So you can imagine if that happens on either side, we talked about creating even precipitation rates. We wanna use head-to-head -head coverage to make sure that those triangles match and are even over those two spaces. When you see people use head-to-head -head, um, throws, the more complex the the shape of the perimeter area, the more difficult it is to do that because you start getting overspray and things like that. Is that where, when we talked about subjectivity versus objectivity, where the more you understand the objectivity of the tools, i.e. your irrigation products, then the better you could design? Or where, where do you lie in that, being yeah. both somebody in irrigation and a, a designer? I think, uh I think I'm gonna um, step on a lot of toes here, but if, uh, if an irrigation designer was designing a landscape, everything would be in, in squares and rectangles because that's a, how a lot of different irrigation components are, are laid out. It's, it, we can easily irrigate. So we got French gardens covered. Right, we can, we can do that pretty easily. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, yeah, we don't live in that. That's not the environment we live in. So we, we need to make sure that the irrigation device adequately irrigates what's been designed and the plants that are in the design while applying the water efficiently and using water uh, conservatively as well. And so is that where so, the need for quarter throws, half throws? You start to get into different angles. There's different variable arc angles, things like the MP rotator with, there you can go from 90 degrees and up to 210 degrees and every degree in between there. So there's adjustment angles there. Drip systems, micro-irrigation spray gets into, into a lot of those well. It gives you the, the ability to irrigate those areas and, and small tight angles and, and sharp curves without the overspray incurred by overhead devices. So there's, there's tools and solutions out there. We just need to, again, take that subjective design and, and look at it with an objective lens and pick the right solutions to fit that. Okay. And um, subsurface irrigation or subgrade irrigation. Yeah. Um, it's self-defining, but can you talk a little bit more about what kind of products are available for that? Yeah, subsurface irrigation, usually we talk about drip and, and, and micro-irrigation in those when senses. Did that come, become popular? It's been around for a while, and I would say that it started with ag, uh, because there's more of an ag background there. And that but, was to like feed each lettuce head or each... Right, so the, but the idea here is that we're putting water down where it needs to go. And where does it need to go? The roots. And the idea is if you isolate it, then you, the, all of it goes to a higher yield, higher, higher efficiency, right. less water waste, right? Right, yeah. So we, we talk about subsurface. We're taking, the, we're taking the atmospheric application out of it, right? So we're, we're no longer at, um, atomizing water or turning into small little water droplets to throw out to get somewhere and possibly blown away with wind or evaporating and things like that, we're gonna put water right where it needs to go in the soil at the roots. So, so we think of point source drip, we think of inline drip, typically is how you see subsurface irrigation being installed. Um, there's a number of different uh, manufacturers out there that have different solutions around there. We have one that's a little bit unique um, in our fleece wrapped irrigation, subsurface irrigation products. Uh, one is called Eco Wrap, the other one is Eco Mat. Right, and, and that's what you we would you just showed me right. the two examples, and one is a tube, mm -hmm. and if you would imagine, it looks like a cloth wrapped around it, yeah, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is two tubes set 
about what 12 inches apart or 14 inches apart 14 yeah. inches apart and yeah. then they have uh, um, emitters every 12 inches on those tubes mm -hmm. but then it's a mat because now you have a piece of plastic cloth uh, I'm sorry a piece of a mat that connects the two yeah and then it like saturates that right yeah it's basically I mean it's it's recycled water bottles and it's it's and, and different components. It's basically polyester. It's a polyester mat that you roll down similar like you would carpet. So, so in, in, a, in an application scenario, you would, you would remove your soil uh, to a certain depth. If we're gonna install on turf, say four to six inches or so, we'll install the mat and, and layer that to cover our complete irrigated surface area. Install a little bit more soil on top of that mat and then lay your sod down on top of that or, or your seed and you'd have some kind of temporary irrigation system to get the roots going down to the mat. But with the water being ap applied right at that root level, now you don't lose any water through, through evaporation loss. You're not losing water through, through application loss and, and water atomization. And really the efficiency of, of a wicking mat like, like we have is, is astronomical. I mean, I'm, I, I, don't think it's appropriate to say that there's 100% um, distribution uniformity over this space, but it's darn close to it. Yeah, and the, the idea is to, is to really create that, that even water spread over an irrigated area, and this does a great job of doing that. And one of the things that I found interesting when I was talking to your team about this product is that not only is it like, you know, efficient in the way of it being subsurface, but also now, if you have a sculpture garden or if you have things that you don't want to get wet through overhead spray, like this solves that. So if you have like, you know, a, um, a Klaus Oldenburg piece in your, in your collection and now it's getting these hard water stains on it, that's a problem. We do not want that to happen. Yeah, um, there, there, will, there will probably be some, some raised voices over the water the hard water stains on that, that piece of art. So yeah, so again, it's, it's looking at the, the subjective side, the, the, the artistic side, and applying an objective solution to it. And these mats are significantly more expensive, so it would be like kind of on a case by case. Right, yeah, it's, when, you, when you look at the, the product cost and the installation cost compared to a, a conventional inline drip system, um, the costs are higher. Yeah. But it's but it's like you said it's not the the everyday solution it's the it's the hey I've got a special scenario where I don't want water to get on this thing or even like a rooftop scenario is a really great example where you've got engineered soils that don't hold a lot of water but you want to have that plant material up there to be lush and look good all the time a, a solution like EcoMat with the fleece um, provides that water and really creates a, 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 a water holding area in that that highly engineered soil. Okay, we have our point of connection yes. from the city. Okay. Right, of water. And we have, let's say, what your, what's your typical PSI, like 90? That's pretty high, right? Yeah, 90 would be, would be fairly abundant. Fairly high. Yeah. So what, like 60, 70 is, let's say, pretty normal in okay. Los Angeles? Is, am I correct? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we go from the water meter. Mm -hmm. What's the first piece of irrigation after the water meter. I would hope that there is some kind of backflow device. Backflow preventer, yeah, right? yeah. And what does a backflow preventer do? So a backflow preventer is kind of in the name. It prevents any water from flowing back into the city main. Why is that? We do, we do not want to contaminate that water that, that goes to the rest of the community. So if we have any kind of infiltration or growth or contamination of water that's in our irrigation system, and it, it, it naturally wants to surge back. It will, yeah, it's as, as we turn valves off and we, we um, suck heads back in, there's a suction, there's a vacuum that's created and we do not want that water contam going back and contaminating the, the main line. So it prevents that water going back into the, right. the, everybody's system. Okay, exactly. so we have the POC, which is the water meter, then mm -hmm. we have the backflow preventer. What's yeah. after the backflow preventer? So after the backflow preventer, um, in, in a, and a, a, a really well-designed irrigation system, we're gonna have a master valve. And that's a shutoff. So a master valve is a shutoff valve. There's two kinds of master valves. Like manually automatic? Well, there's, there's normally closed or normally open. What is that? So a normally open master valve is, is basically an irrigation valve that is open all the time. And it gets a signal, either from a flow sensor or from another device, to say, hey, there's something wrong with the system. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put 
power to that normally open master valve and close it down. And that, How does it know that something's wrong? Like, what's the indicator? So, so that's, that's the next device after the, the master valve is the flow sensor. And the flow sensor talks to the controller and says, hey, for whatever zone is on right now, I know that it's supposed to be flowing 24 gallons per minute. If it's flowing 30 gallons per minute, something's probably broken. It's that sensitive? Or, yeah, it, it, it can be, yeah. It can be, depending on what kind of device you're, you're using. Um, and you, you can set it, depending on what the irrigation controller you're using, you can set what that parameter is as well. So, so these are all really, this is a really critical part of the irrigation system. It's the master valve, the flow sensor, and the controller all working together to make sure that we're not wasting water downstream. So whether there's a zone on or not, let's say there's no zone going on, and, and something happens and the main line down the irrigation system breaks. All of a sudden we have flow. The controller says, I'm reading flow. Thank you, flow sensor. We're not supposed to have flow. Master valve, do your thing. And if it's normally open master valve, it's gonna shut off okay. and restrict flow down there. Now the opposite side of that is a normally closed master valve. And then it'll open selectively. So yeah, normally, normally closed master valve is closed until the controller says, okay, time to irrigate. Why don't you power up and get our system pressurized so we can get everything going. So would that, I th would that be in like a, a, like, is that what a timer does on irrigation? It's a normally closed valve and then the timer says, oh, it's six o'clock, it's time to turn on. Yeah, a, a normally closed master valve is very similar to just like any one of your, your remote control valves. So those are off until they receive power, until it's time for them to open up and then they just let the water flow through them. So that works very similar to a, a normally closed master valve. Okay, let's yeah. run, okay, and then what's after the flow sensor? Yeah, so we've got, just to go through it, we've got the point of connection, we've got the backflow, we've got the master valve, we've got the flow sensor, and now as we're going down the, the main line, irrigation main line, now we start hitting all of our different remote control valves, whether it's a, a, a drip valve. And or, everything's then off of the main line, Yeah, right? everything's off the like, main so line. So you do a main line, like let's say, like a rudimentary perimeter or a half perimeter of the site? Yeah, it all depends on your, on your sure. site, whether it's you know, a loop main line, Right. Helps helps with pressurized helps reduce the amount of pressure you lose through that that piece of equipment. So that um, means that the main line circles back on itself and reconnects. Right. So that way, at the end of that main line, you don't get a significant loss because you have to go through the whole. Thing. Yeah, because because any time water is flowing through pipe, there's friction, right. and we lose pressure through that. So. If we started with that 60 PSI, we need to make sure that we have enough PSI at the end of the line to get that product working appropriately. Even though the main line would be ideal to be looped, probably site conditions restrict that from happening. Is exactly. that correct? Exactly. Okay. Again, we were talking about this, you know, the, the objectivity here is, right. is we need to know the site conditions. Um, what would prevent and, it from looping back then? Um, it could be anything like elevation. It could be construction parameters. Um, it could be cost. I mean, we can't afford to, to run the line. A, a number of different factors. And really, we may not even need it. So, so if we have enough pressure at the end of the line, there's no, no need to loop that thing all the way back around. Like a good 90 and it's a small site right. or 60 or whatever, right. and the math works out, then there's no real point. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we're at the main line mm -hmm. and now we feed in locations off of the main line. Yeah. Break those down. Yeah, so, we, so we'll have, depending on the site, multiple irrigation zones, remote control valves or control zone kits for, for drip systems and micro systems that, that will open, the actuate op open and close based upon the controller's commands to irrigate to allow water to flow through the application devices that are associated with that. So from, you know, we have the, the, the irrigation main line to the remote control valve to the irrigation laterals beyond okay. that. And then the the valves are those green boxes that I see on site. Yeah, so so green or tan. Right. As it's, long, yeah. It's the boxes, right? Usually you'll see like three or four in a row, right? Typic yeah, typically the rectangular boxes, you see a group of them together. And inside of that, if I take the lid off of that, what do I see? Yeah, you'll see, you'll see the top of the valve. Okay. You'll see the bonnet of the valve. And, and what does that valve do? Yeah, so that valve, I'm going to reach over here real quick. Here we've got a brass valve, and this is a, an idea of a, of a remote control, uh, well, I'm sorry, yeah, um, uh, remote, remote control valve. 
basically you have a couple of components here. You've got your, basically your body of the valve. You've got your solenoid here. And you've got your diaphragm okay. here. Your solenoid is, it, it like pushes something. Right? So yeah, it's your solenoid. You can see the wires here. Yeah. This is what gets the signal from the, from the irrigation controller to say, hey, it's time to turn off or right. time to close. So this has a plunger in it. Yeah. And there's, when that plunger is activated, water is allowed to escape. And then it pushes the diaphragm up which will then allow water to start flowing through the valve. Okay. Yeah. And then when the, when the controller says, okay, time to go, I'm gonna take power away from that plunger, the plunger moves again, puts water on top of the diaphragm, creates some equilibrium in the pressure there, the diaphragm closes, and then, we're right, so and then so this will close it. Water? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's more components that go into it, but it's basically we're using water pressure against each other to, to work the valve. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Okay, so main line, then the valves, mm -hmm. and then from the valves. From the valves, you have a slew of opportunity. Sure, that's so, where we get into, so, are we doing micro sprays, are we doing drip, are we doing rotor, right? Right, okay. Yeah, so yeah, so just for all those things you, you mentioned. So we talk about overhead, it's, it's typically what we think about when we think of irrigation. We think of rotors that shoot anywhere from 15 feet out to that 180 feet-ish. Um, their spray heads typically go from you know, a few feet out to 15 to 20 feet or so. Kind of a hybrid of the two are multi-stream, multi-trajectories. We have the MP, MP rotator, which is, which is a, what's a much more efficient manner to, to irrigate spaces in between that kind of 6 to 15, 30 foot range. And um, those are your three kind of basic overhead application devices. Okay. Then there's, um, you, you talk about micro. micro. Components. There's inline drip that we've talked about before. So you, it's a tube with a with an internal application component inside, a drip emitter on the inside of it. There's a hole punched on the outside. So every 12, 18, or 24 inches, there's an emitter on the inside, and you lay that in a grid system to cover a, a an irrigated area. There's there's um, there's that's that's inline. There's online drip application yeah, system. There's really clearly defined the difference between yeah. inline and online. Yeah. So inline is that the emitter's on the inside of the tube, and it, you you buy you buy the tube with the emitter on the inside, and that typically 12 to 18, 24 inch preset. inline space preset. So so that is typically set in a grid like fashion to irrigate evenly irrigated an area. Online are are point source drip emitters. That term's kind of interchangeable there, online or point source drip, um, are the but little buttons that you plug into a, a feeder line, a, a half inch line or whatever it might be, um, and that's put at the base of the plant material. Okay, so let me give you a scenario right. and you tell me which system to use. Okay. So I have um, a, a planting area and then I have in, in one area, I have evenly dispersed ground cover, mm -hmm. um, but then I have like, you know, 10 feet away from it, I have this really specimen, beautiful agave that no other real planting around it. Let's say there's hardscape. Okay. So I'm imagining that in the evenly spaced area, I would use the online? No, the inline. Yes. Which one? Yeah, the inline. In, the inline, in the inline because line. it's preset and yeah. it's evenly. And then for the agave, I would run the tube and then press the, the emitter right where I want it. Right, okay. right. yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really good example. So if you have a, a planted area with fairly evenly spaced plants and, and the density of plants is, is medium to dense, you know, inline drip makes, a, makes good sense with that grid spacing. You're just gonna evenly irrigate that whole area because as long as you have the same water classification needs from all those plants, it's one hydrozone and we should irrigate it that way. Um, good example if you can kind of just picture a, a, a landscape out in Palm Springs where you've got sp very sparse planting um, and there's, there's, um, there's plants that are, like you said, 10 feet away from each other or so, kind of these, these um, specimen species and things like that. We don't need to irrigate the space in between those, those specimens. Let's uh, let's consider point source drip and see if that's going to. Now we save even more money. Yeah. Even more. Potentially, yeah, yeah. What are some of the? Okay, so I'm going to beat this 
to death. Let's do it. <laughs> yes. Okay. And then the like, let's say the last bit of irrigation would then be the micro nozzle. Well, or, 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 or wherever the last piece of water comes from. Yeah, so, so to talk about these application devices, there's also bubblers. Bubblers, oh, bubblers are used, you know, there's trees. Trees are really good, good at, um, uh, or bubblers are a good way to, to irrigate trees. That's the only thing I've known bubbler, bubblers. Yeah, sometimes you do it for larger, large shrubs, large shrubs and things like that. Um, but bubblers are pots, pot of plant material and on podium planting. Be, it all it all depends on the tree. Yeah, I I saw one um, very adequate scenario where they had about twelve bubblers around a giant what specimen kind of tree. Of tree it it was a large oak tree that was probably very or overly irrigated. But mm -hmm. but the idea, yes, is to make sure that again that you're giving the the tree the the water that it needs. And there's a couple different scenarios. There's root zone watering system that allows um, basically tubes in the ground. Um, that allows water to, to feed down into those areas. Um, there's you know, the bubbler right on top of the surface, which works good. Uh, we, we've been seeing the specification where you have a bubbler on top of a pop-up spray head. So, sure, it pops so, up in there. Yeah, so you still have the, the safety and security of a device that, that is hidden in the soil, basically, or at the soil level, so it won't be vandalized. Um, pops up allows the bubbler to action to work and then retracts back down in the soil so it stays safe. So we've seen that to be fairly popular these days. All right, yeah. let's recap it. Yes. Point of connection. We got a point of connection. Yep, that point of connection is from our city main line. Got it. And then from there, we moved our backflow preventer. Got it. That lets make sure that water doesn't go back into the main line and contaminate everything. The master valve is basically letting water flow downstream the rest of the system and will turn off if there's a, a leak event. Somewhere. Now, is it smart to put just a regular old-fashioned hand valve in addition to that as well? Oh, yeah. So we're talking, when you say hand valve, we're talking about different kind of isolation Like I valve. could go in there and just yes. with my hand turn it off. Any kind of manual isolation valves, I would suggest doing that at that point of connection. Okay. So let's go back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Point of connection. So we're point of connection. Backflow. Backflow. Hand valve. Yeah. And really, you know, depending on what kind of project it is, you might have a... a a line that goes specifically towards the uh, a building or a structure, potable water. We want to make sure that we split that line for the for irrigation use, and make to make sure that we can measure that separately, and then control that separately. So after that that split, the utility line that goes into the structure, split that, add your isolation valve or your ball valve there, so you can turn that off and on and work on that separately. So, so yeah, just a little side note, tangent there, but point of connection. You've got your isolation valve. You can have your, your backflow preventer then. Your backflow is going to have some isolation valves on it typically too. Um, master valve, flow sensor, and then downstream from there you've got your different manifolds or banks of, of remote control valves and control zone kits. I always like to design those controls, those manifolds off the main line. So you've got, let's say you've got a one inch main line, just have a one inch kind of sub line that comes off of that. You can stick a, a ball valve or an isolation valve right on each one of those. So you can isolate that bank if you need to work on it for any reason. So from your, your, your irrigation valves now, your control zone kits and your remote control, valve, your control zone valves, um, you've got your lateral lines that go down from that. And then you've got all your different application devices, whether it's overhead spray, whether it's stripper micro spray, bubblers, and so on and so forth. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. That clears a lot for me. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> I hope it does for other people <laughs> as well. Yeah, so too. Um, um, uh, let me think. And that same principle really applies to all of the, all of the systems but just at a different scale, right? So a golf course would probably have a similar system, but the scale would just be more massive. Yeah, water, water typically is going to work the same way. Yeah. And, and the idea is to apply water as efficiently as possible to that landscape that we need. Whether you've got a head, a big open turf area, like you mentioned, a golf course that we're, we're trying to irrigate and we're throwing 80, 100 feet-ish, or whether it's a small little tiny small space in front of a, a restaurant or at, at a, a residential house where we've got a two-foot planter bed. It's, you know, what we're trying to do is just support that landscape as efficiently as possible with the resources that it needs. And we want to make sure that that water is applied in an efficient manner um, so we're not losing it through leaks, through overhead, or through overspray, 
um, through the atomization of water, evaporation, things like that. Let's get that water to where it needs to go as efficiently as possible. Right. Rooftop gardens. Yeah. Yeah. How do we irrigate um, if I have a, let's say a multi housing unit, I have uh, landscaping on the bottom and then they want me to irrigate a rooftop garden as well. Right. How does that work? Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple different scenarios there in it and and really this this um, go it, it shows the importance of communication with the architect and all the engineers involved in the project too. Um, how do we get a water line either up to the top of this building or how do we get a collection device at the top of this building? And sometimes it's a difference between like sometimes um, you could either it works with water pressure or a pump. Right. And yeah. how do you know that? How do so, you know it? Yeah, so that's, that's all working with the, with the developer, with the architect, and saying, okay, am I going to have, are we going to be able to pump water up these four or five stories to make sure I have enough pressure to irrigate this, this area up here? Or am I going to have to collect water somewhere else and then use gravity to feed it somehow, some way. And that's why you see on the East Coast, a lot of these water towers up on buildings for that, that kind of water pressure. You don't see that so much on the West Coast, but um, it's, it's interesting. And, um, and it really, like I said, I, and it's really it takes a lot of coordination with the architect and different engineers of a specific project that way to figure that out. Where does the water, how is that water line from ground level gonna feed up these five stories to get to the top here? Where can I have my valves? We see a lot of questions. Hey, can a can a valve sit upside down in a parking structure? Can it? You can. So <laughs> different, and, yeah, different, yeah, different ways. So um, it, it it all just you know the, we just need to look at that scenario, and and I wouldn't say there's only like one kind of one turnkey solution for it. Um, but again, we talk about green roofs and that green infrastructure. It's extremely important. And, and I think there's, there's so much value to that green space. Um, and we just need to make sure we're, we're irrigating as efficiently as possible. What's a hydro zone? So a hydro zone is, a, is an irrigated area with similar variables to it. So uh, an area of turf could be a hydro zone. Because why? Because, because it, it has similar soil. It's gonna have s potentially similar exposure. But if that turf area wraps around the west side of the building, and then it goes around the north side of the building, and it gets shaded, in the after or it gets shaded. Now, we're talking about two different hydro zones because the exposure is different. Or if I have a planted area, so why would it be a different hydro zone? Is it because of the shade? Um, what does the shade do versus it being in full sun? Like, right. And and and. Yeah, so you, you can imagine that then an area that's going to receive more shade is going to have less evaporation or less evapo, evapotranspiration because it's, cooler. because it's cooler, right? That soil is cooler. And so, so there's, there's going to be less water that needs to be applied to that shaded area compared okay. to the one that's exposed to the sun so all the time. Understanding this correctly, if you have a very heavily shaded area um, and then you turn the corner and it's a very sunny area, you would try to kind of guess where that zone is and then you would split it and then in the shaded area, it'd be hydro zone number one. Mm -hmm. And then you go around the corner and it's really sunny and it'd be hydro zone number two. Correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that, that's a really good example there actually. You're talking about the exposure that, that a similar landscape um, incurs. Um, if you have a large planted area of shrubs and you stick a tree right in the middle of it, that tree has a different kind of root structure, it's gonna have a different hydro zone than the surrounding shrub bed around it too. So those would be different hydro zones. So how does a relationship between hydro zones and valves work? Yeah, so this is exactly where I was going. I'm glad you brought this up. Hydro zones really look at those variables that go into the space that's being irrigated. Where an irrigation zone looks only at how the water is applied. So there's a difference. There's a difference there. Okay, so, let's really, before we leave, yeah. let's really understand the difference between an irrigation zone and a hydro, yeah. and a hydro zone. And this is, this is one that we see, we get this question quite a bit actually too. So, so that hydro zone, again, is that you're looking at the exposure variables, the soil variables, the plant variables. You, they all need to kind of match and be in alignment for that to be considered a hydro zone. Let's just say that we've got an acre worth of turf in one area, and it is one hydro zone. I don't have 
pressure to irrigate one acre at a time. So I need to have multiple irrigation zones to irrigate one hydrozone. So here's the thing, an irrigation zone can or cannot be one specific hydrozone, but a hydrozone can have multiple irrigation zones in it, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, so if I've got, if I'm looking at a residential area and I've got turf in the front yard and turf in the backyard, and they both have the same sun exposure, and it's all the same other variables, that's considered one hydrozone. But I'm gonna irrigate it with different irrigation zones because I don't have the, either the pressure or, or I'm not gonna irrigate front and back at the same time and things like that on, on, on you know, one valve, so. Yeah, so hydrozones are the, are the, the variable, the space, the, the variability of the space and the plant material and the water needs compared to the irrigation zone, which is just focusing on how much water can I put down and how is water, that be, water being applied. What, is the what does the color purple mean to you? The color purple means to me, um, it's not purple rain. Um, it should be. <laughs> it should be. Um, yeah, so we're talking about the... Actually, the rain kind of... It, you know, it's... There's a pun. It's a good pun. There. Zing! Um, but the, what, yeah, what is purple? Yeah, mean? so pur purple indication is the... Is the Kind of nationally, I don't, I can't really, dis, I can't really answer if it's internationally adopted. But the the uh, the color adopted by most municipalities is indicating that there's reclaimed water being used um, in a in an irrigation scenario. Is there a difference between reclaimed water and gray water, or is that the same? So yeah, so no, no. There's there's all different kind of classifications of okay, what reclaimed so water and, and gray. So so reclaimed water goes through a processing. It goes through a, a, a process where it's clean, um, typically by a municipality. Gray water is, is water that, that is used typically through laundry. Um, it's old laundry water, uh, laundry that, uh, water that has not specifically come in contact with human skin or human body. Um, that's a whole different kind of classification. There's sewage water uh, with a different kind of classification. Black water. Black water. Right. There's um, rain water, rain capture water in some scenarios has its own kind of designation too. Um, so I, I think this is, you bring, this is a good thing to bring up because municipalities and health departments are having a conversation of how do we classify these kind of waters and how are we gonna allow them to be used in the landscape? Because there's, at some points there's also a safety right. issue. Right, yeah, because again, we don't, wanna, we don't want water to be contaminated and let people think, oh hey, I can drink water out of this hose or out of this irrigation spigot or this irrigation spray that's going off, because it's not always the case these days, right? So, but at the same time, in Western states, we have a water availability issue, right? And so people want to use their wastewater, whether it's gray water coming out of their, their laundry units and things like that, and put it, apply it to the landscape. Just recently, in the last couple of years, the health department in California said, okay, yeah, you can use that water, um, but you have to apply it at this certain depth underneath your, your finished surface of, of your project. So yeah, there's like no, overhead no overhead spray and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the purple water though, an indication, um, talking about green infrastructure and the value of these green spaces. Um, I spoke at this at the uh, American Society of Irrigation Consultants National Conference uh, of about a month ago. We talked about telling the story and, and really sharing the story and sharing the value of what's, what's happening in that landscape. So when you look at most reclaimed water signs, because you need signs around a space to say, okay, this is irrigated with reclaimed water, do not drink. The question is why? Why is, you know, someone, a uh, uh, layman won't go down the street, enjoying a park or enjoying a space, doesn't understand really, like, why can't I drink this water? It's reclaimed, What's, what are we doing? And I think it's important for landscape architects and irrigation consultants to really expand upon just that simple sign and say, we are saving, we are conserving potable water, your drinking water, and using reclaimed water to irrigate this space. So it's like an opportunity for some advocacy work. Exactly, and the, the opportunity is out there. So we, again, talking about green infrastructure, talking about the value of what a, what a landscape architect and irrigation. The sign out there already, just go to the extra step just extra and just, extra. just, just share this. It's those little ideas that you plant, those little seeds you plant in people's heads throughout the day 
to say, oh wow, like, hey, someone's actually trying to make a really big difference here and trying to help save potable water so I can use that out of my faucet in my house and to drink out of. And we're still gonna be able to enjoy this beautiful space and receive all the ecosystem benefits that it has to offer without using that same resource. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful message that we just need to share more. That's great. Yeah. One of the things that I found interesting in touring the facilities is um, the depth and breadth at which you guys can control your production. Um, and I'd really like to take a deep dive into that so the audience really understands like, you know, um, how, <laughs> how deep you guys actually go. I was very impressed with it. I mean, let's like, I guess, do we start this conversation from the design or the testing or how, like, yeah, like how do we like really let the audience know like the intensity and also um, I'd like to go into, you know, like you guys own a lot of the, like the tooling and the machines and then, you know, also, um, you know, the land here, like let's really like dive into that. Yeah, customer satisfaction along with social responsibility are, are two of our, our, our values as, as a company. And, and it's our responsibility to, to innovate, create, and deliver products that use water efficiently and, and to make sure that we manufacture those in a way that we're not creating all these horrible impacts on the planet. Um, and so along with that, quality and quality control play a really big part. So I think the, the best place to start with it is in that design process, is when we're developing products and ideas for products, we need to think, hey, is this actually going to provide a solution? Is this going to provide a solution that the market needs and the market wants? And is it going to help conserve resources and help, whether it's water or electricity or even labor, uh, for that matter? Uh, so, so it's kind of on that, on that first concept side, you, we're thinking about that, the quality of the product there and its performance. But then what, you know, once we, we pass a product through all the, um, all the stages and it's approved and we're gonna start actually making things, there's all the different components that are being made. And, and after a product, you know, we'll start with the, starting with the tooling, every single one of the tools goes through a series of different checks and parameters just to make sure that it's operating correctly, to make sure that the specifications and measurements are all holding up the way that they need to be. And then when it goes into, when that, when that tool goes into production and plastic, molten plastic is being injected into it to make forms, those components come back, come back out and they are being checked on a regular basis. The more complex the, the, the part and the piece, the more frequently we see that being checked and monitored. So it's, it's really cool actually, where we've got our whole quality control department who is stationed right next to a production area and they go out and they pick products out and they look at them under microscopes and measuring devices. And if anything's wrong, they can shut the whole production line down right there and say, hey, we're not gonna make any more of this. We need to address this issue. Whether it's a tooling issue, whether there's something wrong with the tool, maybe it just needs to be clean, maybe there's a defect in the plastic, we shut everything down right there just to make sure. Going down the line, after assembly, products are air tested and water tested. So we, we get complaints often that, hey, you sent me a, a used valve. There's water already coming through it. <laughs> well, we've well, guess what? Yeah, we, we've put water through it to make sure that it wasn't gonna leak and hold. I mean, so. that's a fair enough complaint. Like, right. it would be odd. Any like other it. product that you get probably wouldn't have it, so. Exactly, um, yeah. But I, I, I would guess that after they hear that, they say, oh, okay. Yeah, they go, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, good to know, yeah. good to know. Um, Maybe a little sticker on the box that we've, says. We've thought about that. Yeah, it says, the, hey, if there's water here. Yeah. <laughs> every, every, every single valve, every single valve is water tested uh, before it goes, we believe our distribution center. Uh, the, um, yeah, but, but rotors, MP rotators, spray heads, they're all tested at a specific rate to make sure that, oh, okay, yeah, this batch of material is, is water tested, ready to go, and it's gonna, it's gonna perform the way that it needs to and the way that specs say that it should. 
Beyond that though too, we do life cycle assessment testing of all of our products. We've got, a, we've got a, all of our testing department that just tries to break product all the time, whether it's ours or our competitors, just to see, hey, where do, where do we stand? You know, can this controller sit in a 130 degree box in the middle of the Saudi desert? Can, can this you know, irrigation component sit in North Dakota uh, in the middle of January and not explode? you know, kind of thing, or not crack under freeze conditions, kind of stuff. So, so we test for all that kind of stuff, so we know what our parameters are, and we can design by it, too. So it's, um, yeah, so whether it's, it's through quality control or testing, or, and, and performance testing in that matter, too, making sure that all the nozzles are still performing the way that they need to, um, that happens, and it's a big part of Hunter Industries on a day-to-day -day basis. What is yeah. FX Luminaire? FX Luminaire is a lighting manufacturer that we procured um, you know, 10 years ago or so now. They just celebrated the 30th anniversary as, um, as, a, as a company. So FX manufactures um, low voltage landscape lighting, anywhere from um, path lights, up lights, down lights. Um, but really the, the innovation with lighting has been the control and transform. And, and really we've, we've taken irrigation technology into coder systems and we've turned that into lighting technology where, where typically we would, be, we would run a, a, a 14 two wire or 12 two wire. That's the gauge? That's the gauge wire, yeah. So what's, what's a 14 two and so, a 12 so the, Yeah, two. the 14 two would be the, the size, the gauge of right. the wire. And the and larger the number, the bigger, the, the smaller correct. the gauge. Is correct, okay. yeah. So, so. You, you would run one of those wires throughout your, your landscape and you would run power, you would hook that up to a transformer and you would hook all your lights up to it and you would turn it on and all your lights would turn on. What is a transformer? So a transformer is similar to a, uh, an irrigation controller, but it does one extra thing. Well, it kind of does the same thing. So it's a transformer is your timer or your clock. So it tells when the system, when your lights turn on and off, but it takes that 110 energy and just reduces it down to your 12 volt. So it's a little bit safer. So it's landscape. transforming it down? Is yeah. that the, the origins of the name? Is that? Right. Okay, right. so I have 110, mm -hmm. or maybe, Oftentimes, even 220, right? Yeah, you you would you would you would have you would break down from yeah. 220 to 110, right? To 12 volt. Yeah, 12, 14 volt ish. Okay. And, and that's uh, what's considered low volt. 12, yeah, 14. Low, yeah. Okay. In, in, can I touch 12 or 14 volt? You, you can, and you will know it. You will know it. Yeah. But you shouldn't. You shouldn't. I please don't anybody take. And go touch a live. Do not. Do touch. not. Do not do that. <laughs> yeah. Do not do that. You will know it. I've done it you several know, times. It says low voltage. It's, you don't want to touch. It. I don't. I don't like any voltage going through my body. But um, <laughs> I've been there, done that. Um, but basically, so we're talking about this transformer, and it's controlling the lights turning on and off. But going back to that innovation side, and what's happening with lighting there is. Um, you know, typically all the lights would turn on at the same time and they would all turn off at the same time. But we've taken this decoder technology where we've, we've given, given addresses to each one of the lights in the landscape now. So we can have lights turn on and off at different times of the day, which is was really mind blowing in the last couple of years. Can you do it to the music of Queen? Um, but not yet from us, but we're getting pretty close to it. Um, but now, so now you can say, hey, I had, at dusk, I want all my lights to turn on at at fifty percent. So now we've, we can we can get intensity in there too, right? So so now we've got all of our lights on at fifty percent. An hour after dusk, when it's darker, I want all my lights to turn on to a hundred percent. Can it be a gradual jump as opposed to just no? Stepped? No, we we do it in a step in a step manner. Um, later on in the night. Um, everybody's gone home. You don't want any of the path lights on anymore. You just want to look out your house and see the trees uplit. You can turn all your path lights off and have your trees uplit. Turn everything off. Only have maybe some, some minor security lighting on if you wanted to. And turn everything back on during sunrise, just an hour before sunrise. So there's much more variability that you can play with on the aesthetics on the FX side because of the, the really the transformer is called Luxor. So take all that innovation and now add color. Add 30,000 different color spectrum possibilities and you've got that whole subjectivity side of design that we've been talking about back into the play here again as well. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of really cool innovation on the FX side of things.
What's the difference between 2,000 Kelvin and 5,000 Kelvin, and why is that important to understand? Oh my gosh, you're going to have to help me on that one. Okay, but basically, um, you know, it's, it's about the, the temperature, right? Right, And so 2,000 would be very warm, mm -hmm. right? And it would, it would mimic more of how y we interpret, like, the sun, right? right? And then, you know, 2,700, I, as a designer, tend to... 2,700 is, is the sweet spot, right? It, to, to me, it's, right. it's subjective, right? But uh, to me and a lot of other designers, I think, feel that 2,700 is a very uh, tasteful uh, number or temperature. Um, if you kind of go into color theory as well, like, like if, some, if a temperature is warm, it tends to lean towards you know, your reds. And if a temperature is cool, it tends to lean towards the, the blues, white, white, right? Blues. Uh, whites and blues, right? And so you have 2,700, and then you start getting into 3,000, which I think still feels warm. And then once you gradually go up, um, if you go, into uh, a, uh, you know, there's a 7-Eleven by where I live and you walk in and it's just a hundred, you know. Uh, you need your sunglasses. Yeah, and it's so cool. It's like 4,000, 5,000 Kelvin. Yeah. And it just feels really uncomfortable right. in there. Um, and, you know, one of the things with when you're designing lighting is if you the more you know your temperatures, the better of a designer you could be because not necessarily is 2700 the rule or keeping it 2700 the standard. If you can get like a 4000 temperature or 3500 and you put it in a tree and then you put it in like, let's say like a Chinese elm that has like a very interesting, uh, you know, um, like growth pattern to it, mm -hmm. then you could do a down lighting, which is called like a moon lighting, certain, and now you have those those sh those shad those shadows that 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 go down. Right. So, um, and that was you know you, you talk about when we, we talk about the Kev Kelvin temperature, and that was really um, a challenging aspect when we started making that shift from incandescent lights to LED okay. lights. Yeah, and when was that? Do you know when that was kind of? I'm sure it took a while for between LED and incandescent, that transition wasn't overnight, but when did it kind of become mainstream? Yeah, I would say that mainstream over the last five years or so. Yeah. Um, and just, and really, that recent. yeah, I mean, it was, and there's still manufacturers out there who, who sell incandescent lights, we don't anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, I mean, just with the energy savings alone, it's, yeah. It's a huge argument for Probably it. Production costs too. Right. So, um, but, but once we were able to, to figure out the the those Kelvin challenges and those temperature count, those challenges with the LED lights, I mean, it really opened the door for us and a number of different innovative design opportunities to give you to right. play with. And then integrating that within the technologies that you've already developed with the right. with the irrigation. All all using that same wire, that same fourteen two or twelve two wire that you're going to put on the landscape. So. Sometimes I find, and this is just in my own odd theoretical brain, but I feel like there's a lot of similarities between designing irrigation and light. Yeah. Like as far as like the throws and the concepts. Well, I think light has a different dimension to it, but um, how do you feel about that? It's very similar. It's, it, it's, it's, it's all about the dynamics of how electricity flows through own wire. Water flows through pipe, and there's you have voltage loss, voltage drop. The further out you go, you're going to have water friction loss as you're moving through pipes and things like that. So yeah, it's very, very similar. The further down you are on a, a long length of, of wire, you're going to have a lower voltage down there than you're going to have right at the source. Same thing for irrigation. At the end of the line, it's going to be lower pressure. So yeah, there's a lot of similarities there, and, the, and you, you need to make sure that you're accommodating for that voltage drop and for that, that pressure loss. Too. So if a transformer is a step-down unit, mm -hmm. I think that's a very like rudimentary way of saying it, 
Is there step down units for irrigation? Like yeah. if it's coming in really like heavy PSI, when what is that? Yeah, there's there's several different opportunities for you there. So so again, the idea. Why would you need that? Yeah, so the idea, going back to to what we started to be to talk about to begin with in design is making sure that that water is applied to the landscape as efficiently as possible. So as a manufacturer, we design these application components, but they're designed within a specific operating pressure range. So a rotor likes 40 to 60 PSI. An MP rotator likes 40 PSI. A spray head typically likes 30 PSI. If they get too high above those parameters, that water is going to throw through and it's just going to spray and atomize and that water is just going to turn into mist and not get to where it needs to go. And vice versa, you know, if there's not enough pressure going through it, you know, it's just going to dribble out and we're not going to, we're going to have a similar result. So, um, so really it's making sure that that, that device, that application device is working where it needs to be working. So we talk about the step down, we talk about pressure regulators. Okay. Yeah. So where, let's go back to our. Yeah. So, so, so a pressure regulator yeah. can go, can be installed on multiple areas in multiple different configurations. Oh, it wouldn't be just one central? Right, so you can have one central pressure regulator. That would make sense if one zone actually needs this pressure and another one needs Right, it. yeah. So if we install a pressure regulator at near close to the point of connection, then everything gets that. Everything is going to be stepped down, but let's just say we have a, a zone that's really close to that point of connection and then one 500 feet down away from it. Right, you would step down the one closest and then let the other one just through distance and friction regulate right. itself. Yeah, so, so we, can, we can have this main point of connect where you have this main pressure regulator that goes on to your main line pipe. There's pressure regulators that I like to use on valves too. So right at the valve, you can say, okay, I wanna make sure that this fixed pressure is coming out of the valve. You know, I've seen some people put that on every valve. Yeah, some, you know, some, in like some cases. Like as a safety measure? I'm not or? sure it's so much of a safety measure, but just to make sure again that the the application devices are getting the pressure that they, they need. You see that, um, I'm gonna grab this, this component here, you see that a lot in, in uh, control zone kits or drip kits here. So this component here is the pressure regulator. So anything coming the at it, part or the whole thing? This, this white part right here. This is the pressure regulator. Yeah, this is the pressure regulator device right there. So, so that piece. Is, there di is it based off a diaphragm? No. No, there's a, there's a spring-loaded, um, mechanism in there. And then the spring yeah. is rated for, like it'll squeeze at this, at this percentage. Right, and this one's rated at 25 PSI. So, so the water that comes in here with, let's say at 60 PSI, coming out of here at the end of this is gonna be 25 PSI. What's this whole unit? So here we have the valve. Right. This, this is the valve that, that actuates, opens and closes with the diaphragm inside of it. Right. This component here is the filter for a drip system. So inside this you're gonna have a screen filter. And that is for uh, particulars in the water? Yeah, so any kind of components, um, heavy metals, components, debris, and things like that that gets caught because our drip application devices typically have small little tiny orifices and we don't want those to get clogged up. So, so we'll filter and screen it there. And then downstream from that is the pressure regulator to make sure again that, that those application devices are Why getting the right pressure. filter at an angle? There must be a reason for that. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't have the exact answer for it. If I was the product engineer, I can tell you. But I'm sure it has to do with the, the movement of water over that. And sure, because the direction of water is going this way. Correct, yeah. And then it comes up through here. It comes up, fills out the sides, and then drains back down. The yep. And then it comes back down. Correct. And then Correct. ideally, when you get to here, you would have a cleaner water. Right, you're going to have water that doesn't have any debris that's going to be able to clog your your application orifices down the line, yeah. So, so we got the filter, going back to the pressure regulator here. Yeah. Again, this is a, a pressure regulator that's right on the valve. We have pressure regulator, regulators that sit on the solenoid too, if you're not using a, a drip system. But the best place, in my opinion, for pressure regulation is right at the head. At the head? At the head, yeah. So, so here we have uh, a spray head, this one is a clear one. And this is only clear just for demonstrations. It's clear for demonstrations, yeah. If you ever get a clear head, please do not put that in your landscape and install it. But it will, it's so it, cool. Man. It does look cool. You can see all the parts <laughs> in it. Um, notice the difference here. Um, we've got a brown cap and we've got a gray cap here. What, why? And so the gray cap says right on it, it says PRS 40, meaning this is regulated to 40 PSI. 
right so here. Ideally, it operates at 40. So this is going to operate at 40 psi as long as you have at least that coming into it or greater. And this one here is PRS 30 or 30 psi, meaning that 30 psi is going to come out of this head. So when we talk about the, the sprays that go on top of this, typical spray heads work really well at 30 psi. So you would associate a brown cap, our brown cap, with a, with a spray head. The gray head here, this is 40 psi, so that's the MP rotator range. So an MP rotator will work really great on this, so this gray cap. Greater, what, how, what, uh, explain that to me a little bit more. You said at 40 psi or greater. Oh yeah, so, so if I have 30 psi yeah. coming at the end of this pipe and I've got a 40 psi head. Just no water will come out. I'm not, water will come out, but I'm not gonna boost up to 40 psi. And we get that confusion sometimes where we say, well, it says 40 psi on it. How come I'm not getting 40 psi on it? We're like, well, you only got 35 coming in. It's not, it's not a booster. Okay, so let's say I have 60 coming in. Yeah, what happens? if you have 60 psi coming in, plumbed to the bottom of this, yeah. for only 40 psi is gonna be coming out of it's this. It's gonna be coming out. And that yeah. is controlled by the, the, by the physics of this spring. Yeah, you, you can see it actually, it's a smaller spring here, that green spring on the inside, that's a pressure, pressure regular device there. Oh, and this yeah. spring is only for, to, for the pop-up. Yeah, the big, big spring is the, is the so pop-up spring. Springs. And you can kind of see that pressure regular pop at the top there a little bit, it's got that greenish spring. But yeah, that's the pressure regulator inside now, there. Now, if this is, if a spring is being sprung, I don't know if that's the right yeah. way to say it, a um, little Dr. Seuss there, but if a spring is being sprung, you know, every day for five years, mm -hmm. um, does that change then the, 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 cause it's a really low tech, right? Right. So does then that change or probably not significantly enough to. Not over that five years if it's used within normal parameters. Sure. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's part of our warranty is to make sure that we can, we can right. that will operate will, the way yeah. it's supposed to be in that, in that time. Um, right, and then, I feel like it would get looser after a yeah, while. Yeah, it'll get looser. And really, uh, typically we don't see a, a springs getting looser, but you'll see irrigation heads that are popped up yeah, and, they do, and then they don't retract. And why is that? And that's usually debris. Of course. It's more debris than anything else and rather than the spring. There's more debris and friction in there, so it, it doesn't allow that, that spring to retract. And then you, do you like get a like 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 a, a pneumatic solution for that like 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 shoot it with air or something yeah well it's it's you know these they're fairly typically easy to clean yeah. you can you take the cap right off and and clean that out clean some debris out around there if you needed oh. to and and wash that out and that that could solve your problem right right so right. instead of going and replacing them, that might be your first line of defense as, to try to clean it. As much as I would love for you to buy all new Hunter <laughs> spray heads and sprinklers and put them in, um, at the same time, we don't need to be wasteful. Right. And you know, we've already bought a plastic component you put in the ground. Yeah. Let's just make sure that we can clean it and maintain it first before you need to go then buy another one. Yeah. Great. Um, your title, again, the corporate social responsibility manager. Okay, which leads us into our next um, area of conversation. Um, I see here that it says a balance between people, planet, profit, stewards of the environment, and the communities in which we work and play. Break down some of the um, ways that you actually are able to incorporate that. Right, so the... Um I mean, you just mentioned it. I mean, when you when you take away all the things that we do, when you take away all the the manufacturing processes that we've talked about, that vertical integration and the the marketing and the the products and and all that kind of stuff, really we consider ourselves here at Hunter Industries just stewards of the environment and the communities in which we live, work, and play. And as stewards, we're we need to be responsible for the actions and decisions that we that we make. And and how we define that, we group that into the into those three basic buckets is the people, planet, and profit. Um, we are, as I know, really one of the only manufacturer, irrigation manufacturers around that has a dedicated position for any kind of corporate social responsibility or sustainability program. And, and it's, you know, it's starting to grow more in an industry, but it's kind of sad because we are the original green industry. I mean, we're working with the environment and supporting the environment um, as landscape architects and contractors and maintenance individuals and, and the different manufacturers that support that whole process, whether it's a soil manufacturer or, or um, fertilizer manufacturer, I mean, it's all, it's all part of this green infrastructure. 
And, and I think we, we owe this industry a little bit more to, to be better stewards and really understand our impacts and to kind of really kind of catch up to the rest of the world and this, this movement around sustainability and corporate social responsibility. And, and in the industry that we're in, this green industry, we have the potential to make some really, really great impacts and talk about the value of the, the systems that we're supporting. So that's what corporate so social responsibility really is to me. It's, it's understanding the, the benefit impacts that we can have, not just on our company or, or our industry, but really on, on these, these communities that we live in and work in and, and play in and, and the, the bigger picture of society that, that we're working with here. So that's one, one thing we work on and you know, it's, we, we talk about the sustainability side and that really looks towards the, the planet side so we work on ways to, to decrease our water footprint on campus. We look at ways to decrease our, our carbon footprint. Uh, we have got paper reduction programs going on, recycling programs going on. Um, on, the, on the people side, it's all about making sure that we're treating the people that we influence and we work with the way that we treat ourselves. So whether it's our employees through employee wellness programs and, and health and safety programs, um, customers with, um, awesome programs to help them grow their business and to, to really educate them on products so they can be better, more successful people in the, in the industries they work. Um, and then the, you know, the profit side. I mean, we are, uh, we are a for-profit company. And if it wasn't for-profit, we wouldn't be able to invest in any of these other people on planet sections and, and, and talk about the, um, the ability to be an influencer, influencer and, um, and advocate for, for green infrastructure, really. You know, one thing I want to talk about um, is this, this idea of circular economies and, and creating this circular movement of, of goods and processes and people in any kind of system. And I think our, our irrigation controller recycling program is a, is a, a fairly good example of, of the green industry getting um, involved in, in the circular economy. You know, we, we feel responsible for the product that we sell that is used in a landscape and, and after it's done, what happens to it? Well, like I said, we feel kind of responsible for what happens to it. Does it go to a landfill? Does it sit in the soil? Um, those probably aren't so devastatingly uh, negative planet affecting um, events or movements, but again, it's just a th piece of plastic just sitting there when it could be used for something. We started a recycling program on those, our, our rotor heads and sprinkler heads a couple years ago and, uh, and it failed, unfortunately. We, we just couldn't get people to bring old heads back to distributors for us to collect and then go process. It turned out to be very expensive too. We would have to spend over, well, we'd have to collect over 80,000 pounds of, of old heads to be processed and it just, it, it didn't financially work out. But, but we've partnered with, with one of our distributors, Union Irrigation, on a controller recycling program. When we think of an a, a irrigation controller um, sitting in a landfill, um, that potentially may cause harm with some of the electronic components in it, and we just want to make sure that those don't get there. So we found a, a recycler in, in Colorado through through UN irrigation actually and um, and the recycler is called Blue Star Recyclers and Blue Star the CEO there has um, I believe it's his brother um, has autism and so Bill Morris the CEO of, of Blue Star took his brother to adult daycare one day and saw a group of kids adult people with autism sitting in the back room just taking apart electronic equipment. And he said, hey, these guys are really good at this, and this is a marketable skill. So he developed this organization where, where these people were allowed to bring in, or where, where they, they collected recycled components, recycled material components. People on the autism spectrum were hired and employed to, to take these components apart and work on them and, uh, and, and, and separate the electronics from the plastics and things like that, and then, um, and then make 
profit from that. And, and really, it's kind of cool. So now we've got this, this system where we're taking potentially harmful equipment out of a landfill that's being separated and disposed of properly. We're employing people who wouldn't normally be able to be employed in any given scenario. And we've created a whole new economy out of it. So it's, it's a really cool, interesting idea that now we're, we're taking a waste product and we're, we're building, a, building an economy out of it. And it's, it's a really cool example of that circular economy and I hope we can grow it. So anybody out there listening or watching, please take your irrigation controller uh, to a Ewing branch your old irrigation controller, whether it says Hunter or any one of the uh, a different manufacturer on it, take it to a Ewing branch, put it in their, their controller recycling box, and uh, we'll make sure that it's, it's appropriately taken care of. Okay. Any closing thoughts? Um, yeah, I just think it's... Um, oh, well, number one, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you and your audience. Um, you talk about this green infrastructure and, and sharing the message and planting seeds and being an advocate. I think that's something that our industry needs to do a lot more of. Um, we all know the benefits of the things that we produce and create, um, but I don't think everybody else does on a regular basis. Or, or maybe they just don't, um, they don't connect it, right? So I think there's, there's a bigger story that we need to share and need to tell as, a, as an industry and, or, and this bigger organization. And I want to figure out how to do it with everybody, really too, whether it's a, an irrigation component or whether it's the, what's the value of a tree idea? So what, what is the value of a jacaranda tree growing in Long Beach right now? I mean, there's value there, right? What, what is it? So if we, we need to quantify that value greater than just numbers. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, and it's hard to do, right? It's hard to do in the, in the political system that we're in. So when we, when we think about, I, I love the scenario. It's, this is in Texas, this happened where you know, they had their drought measures and they cut off water to municipal trees. They lost 560 million trees due to drought measures and urban trees dying. Um, it's horrible, right? You lose all that value of the trees. Well, they did a study. They said the economic value, the social and economic value of those trees is somewhere close to like $280 million annually that they lost year over year from letting those tree die, trees die. And was the, the amount of water saved equitable to the amount of that social and economic value that those trees provi provided? I mean, I don't know, but I would argue that we need to th look at that. Like how do we develop a matrix to kind of um, you know illustrate how vast the importance is right there's a there's a fauna right dependency on trees there's like the i mean and it's and more and more as as cities are developing climate action plans, trees and landscapes play an integrate role for cities achieving their climate action plans and hitting their, their carbon sequestration goals and things like that. So we're going to need irrigation to support those landscapes and those trees. So, so how the next time we incur a drought or some kind of climate crisis, how are we going to fight for our industry and the, the value that it provides? Rather than saying, okay, yeah, you're right, I can't irrigate. So I, th I just think we need to have a, there, we need to have an equitable conversation with municipalities and governing agencies of, of okay, what are we, we're saving water, but what are we losing? And I think we got a, a good idea of what we lost in the last drought, and I just think we need to be prepared the next time this happens. Yeah. No? Um, climate change. Right. Uh, you know. Where does Hunter stand in regards to thinking about the future? And, and not just in regards to being a sustainable company, but what kind of measures, what kind of irrigation technologies um, are going to be more uh, prolific or more... Um, yeah, I don't... You're talking to the corporate social responsibility manager here. So, so of course, I look at the risk that climate change um, 
kind of shows us or the, the, you know what what risk do we need to mitigate or we need to think about in the future that's going to affect our company and really affect our industry affect our communities right and how can we be a positive influencer in that how can you be a yeah so i think it's a lot it starts a lot with conversations like this just talking about it i think that I'm not sure that there's any one little product that we make, a widget, we would say, here's gonna be our solution. And, and I doubt that there ever will be. But you know what, when, we need to start thinking of these systems. Right. Like the, a comprehensive ideology? Right, so when, you, so when you think about the impacts of these bigger systems and, and how water, the relationship of water and soil and the environment and people and, and government and governance and how all this kind of works together. Because, I mean, it's, we talk about green infrastructure and the positive influence it has there. The same can be said for agriculture, too. I mean, we have a, a, one of our business units is Seneger. It's an irrigation manufacturer based out of Florida that does center pivot and solid set irrigation components. Right, that's when you fly over an airplane and you see those big circles. Exactly. That's a center pivot, right? Because right. the pivot's in the center and then it shoot it not shoots, but it goes down a pipe. Yeah. And, then, and then that circles around. Exactly. Okay, so explain to me how that ties into what you were just yeah. saying? Yeah, so, so when you're in the airplane and you're looking at those big giant crop circles, that's a ton of acreage that's down there. And do you think that those, those spaces and that land can have any kind of influence on climate change? I do. And really, we, you start having this conversation about climate or carbon positive farms and farms that are now working to sequester carbon rather than suck, car rather, rather than exude more carbon. And it's all, you know, it goes into this greater conversation of, of, hey, how can we still produce what we need to produce, if not more, have, have less of a negative impact and actually have positive impacts on the environment, help get us to these climate action plan initiatives that we need to get to, and still innovate as we're, as we're going through this process. You know, what's the, what's the famous saying from Einstein? Like, how do, you, how do you expect to ever fix anything for the future if you keep on using the same mindset that you did in the past to get you to the problems that you're, get you in the problem the situation you're in now, right? And that's, I, we are, I really think we're at this changing point just as a global community is, is you, we have an opportunity to make some really big changes and think about the systems that we're involved in a little bit different, a lot differently. So right now, your role, it's just you in this role, but soon you're going to be hiring somebody else to kind of work under you, right? Right. We're going we're gonna to be expanding the, the corporate social responsibility kind of spectrum here. And whether it's me or other people involved, um, Hunter Industry is, is it's dedicated. It's one of our core values here at, here at Hunter. And, and we're going to be really trying to expand both our efforts externally to get this message going, working with organizations like the, Ameri or the Irrigation Association, the IA, ASLA, American Society of Landscape Architects. I mentioned ASIC before, American Society of Irrig Irrigation Consultants. Um, we work with the, the NALP um, and a number of different kind of landscape organizations to really share this message and build these partnerships with people so we can promote this, not just in our industry, not just in our green, green industry, but but outside as well and promote that value. So there's that external look, and then there's the, extern the internal look as well. So again, how, do we, how are we managing ourselves and how are we being that steward to the environment and the communities in which we live, work, and play? And you started out in sales and then transitioned over to this position now. Yeah. What did being in sales teach you about the, the zeitgeist of our community? Right, so the... Um, I'm gonna take one step back further, maybe a couple more steps back too. I started in the landscape industry, um, watering plants at our nursery, and then it was a design build, design build nursery, so I was pouring concrete and digging trenches and things like that. And this to, is when you were 14. Yeah, yeah, I started when I was 15 years old and, and kind of kept on going from there. Um, went to Cal Poly Pomona because I knew I didn't want to keep on digging trenches for my entire life. But, um, yeah, the transition from, from practicing to becoming a salesperson, what it really showed me is, is, number one, I didn't really sell anything. I just worked with landscape architects like yourself to talk about product. And hopefully you would put it on your plans, and then someone would eventually dab, buy the product sure. later. I'm dealing with Jason and Nick. It seems more of advocacy yeah. for your product than it is direct sales. Right. We, yeah. Not trying to press, hey, I need you to 
buy 100 units from right. me. It's more about just saying what we could do and then playing the long game. It's, it's more of an account manager kind of thing than anything else. But, but really, it's what, what I learned, to go back to your original question, like what I learned from that sales perspective was, was how fast things change. Mm. Things change really fast overnight. And, and going back to drought and, well, going back to drought in California overnight, Jerry Brown said, hey, you know what? You can't water. No more watering these park strips, no more doing this. And it changed the face of the landscape in California. Which then changed the face Over, of beer. Changed the face of beer. And it, everybody was reeling and trying to figure these things out very, very quickly. And we did. I mean, we figured it out. I think we could, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I think we can plan for things, these things a lot more and better. But when you get to those points, and, and I, I went from having rosy conversations with landscape architects like yourself about plants and irrigation and things like that to spending time in city council chambers and talking to council members and just saying, hey, you want to cut water to your community, but there's so much value. Look at the value that we're losing here again. Like this park that everybody goes to on a regular basis, why are we going to shut the water off to it? So we need to be able to manage that better. And so that's kind of what I turned into as a salesperson uh, towards the end of it. And as, as that was happening, our, um, the corporate social responsibility manager position rolled up and, or, or opened up at, at Hunter Industries. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to, to slide into that. Yeah. Great. Well, I really appreciate taking your time. I feel like I have learned a tremendous amount um, on not only but hunt, not only about hunter industries, but in, about irrigation as a whole. Um, I appreciate your patience and the tour of the facility, and um, thank you. Well, I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. Um, I like to leave with calls of action. I just want again. I want you and your listeners and your, your viewers just to to understand that we need to work together to make changes. And, and really to, to, to create this value in green infrastructure and, and our industry. So I'm looking forward and I'm excited to work with, with everybody to make that happen. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Cool. That was great. I hope there's value there. I mean, tremendous. I mean, you're very well spoken. It's very interesting.